the season and habitat you're birding in are great starting points for narrowing down the species you can expect, yet they're often overlooked. In this video we're focusing on four buntings you might find in coastal areas of Western Europe in autumn and winter. Most buntings are brown and streaky and can be hard to view when they're feeding in vegetation, often making them an identification headache. Here we'll tackle some of the brownest, streakiest of the bunch and give you some top tips for working out which bunting you've bumped into. Watch these two clips then see if you can use the features mentioned to identify them. We'll play the same clips at the end of the video and reveal the answers. So you've bumped into a bunting, but which one? Across much of Western Europe, reed bunting is the default brown, streaky bunting, so it's well worth getting to know it in all plumages. Local wetlands are good places to start looking for them, especially where there are reed beds. Reed bunting by name, reed bunting by nature. They readily visit feeders, usually more rural locations, though they will venture into suburban gardens too, particularly in late winter and early spring. They're commonly found in many vegetated coastal habitats, notably in autumn when local movements and small influxes of Scandinavian breeding birds combine to swell numbers. Reed buntings are medium-sized buntings, the size of a great tit. In the breeding season, males have a characteristic black hood and bib, accentuated by a broad white collar and bright white submustachial stripe that runs diagonally down from the base of the beak. A ghost of this pattern can be visible in winter too. If you can see that, you're onto a reed bunting. Non-breeding plumage males and almost all females lack this distinctive pattern though. If I had to choose one word to describe most reed buntings in autumn and winter, it would be stripy. The head is boldly marked with a creamy buff supercilium above the eye and similar coloured or slightly paler submustachial stripe. These pale markings are made more prominent by dark borders, usually reddish brown above and below the supercilium and darker brown to black either side of the submustachial stripe. That's the pale stripe running diagonally down from the bill base. All these stripes give a close-faced look. The upper parts are equally stripy, with reddish-brown edges to the wing feathers, black and mid-brown stripes running down the back, and usually two fairly conspicuous straw-coloured braces or tram lines down the middle of the back. The underparts are usually off-white, with a variable amount of reddish to dark-brown streaks, often quite diffuse, and the legs are fairly dark, reddish to grey-brown. Reed buntings usually feed on the ground or in reeds or other seed-bearing plants. They often seem quite nervous, habitually splaying their tails to reveal white outer tail feathers. The two commonly heard calls are a high-pitched down-slurred siu and a more rasping sparrow-like call, frequently given by autumn migrants. Little bunting breeds from eastern Scandinavia all the way to eastern Russia, wintering in southern Asia. In western Europe they're a scarce migrant, with most British records from the northern isles and the east coast in autumn. However, as the winter progresses, some make their way inland, where they can turn up anywhere with wintering buntings or finches, such as stubble fields and feeding stations. Patience is usually needed to get a good view, as they spend a lot of time on the ground, though they will perch up in trees and bushes. Despite the name, little buntings are goldfinch sized. They are petite for a bunting, though this can be hard to judge on lone individuals and should be used with caution. Fortunately there are some characteristic plumage features to look for. The face looks much more open than in reed bunting, dominated by orangey brown cheeks and a prominent white eye ring. This in turn makes the eye stand out more than in reed bunting. The median coverts near the bend in the wing are tipped white, creating an obvious wing bar. Although well marked, the back is slightly less colourful than reed bunting, lacking pale tram lines. They often look smart when seen from behind, think grey pinstripe suit. In the same vein, the underparts are generally pure white, with clearly defined narrow black streaks, altogether a very dapper little bird. The top of the upper mandible, or colman, is straight, making the bill appear sharper than reed bunting. However, this isn't easy to assess, 
A better feature to look for are the pale pink legs. Little buntings make a sharp zick call, somewhere between the tick of a robin and the softer zit flight call given by song thrush. Superficially similar to little bunting on plumage, with the open-faced appearance, white wing bar and white underparts, Lapland bunting is actually rather a different beast. They are meadow pipit sized but bulkier in the body and longer winged, creating a much more skylark-like jizz, quite different from both little and reed bunting. On the closed wing, the black primaries extend about halfway beyond the rest of the wing feathers towards the tip of the tail, and you should check this feature on any potential Lapland bunting. The primaries are much shorter on the two smaller buntings. The plumage is more variegated than reed or little, and more variable too. They always show a reddish brown wing panel, and the same colour is sometimes present on the nape as birds start to acquire breeding plumage in late winter. The back is heavily streaked and usually shows conspicuous pale tram lines. The underparts are mainly white or off-white, with blackish streaking usually restricted to the upper chest and a narrow strip along the flanks. In breeding plumage, adult males have an all-black face and throat. Like reed bunting, a ghost of this pattern can start to appear as the breeding season approaches, and occasionally late departing birds can be seen in near full breeding plumage. Lapland bunting is a rather scarce and local winter visitor, usually to open coastal habitats such as salt marsh, shingle beaches and nearby rough grassland. However, they will join skylarks and other buntings in stubble fields, occasionally well inland. They're often first detected in flight, when their most common vocalisations are dry rattles interspersed with soft, whistled choo calls, sometimes written as tiki tiki choo. Snow buntings breed on a few mountain tops in Scotland, but most birders are more likely to encounter them in coastal areas during the winter months, where they're generally more numerous than Lapland bunting and more likely to be found along the strand line on sandy beaches. They're usually very distinctive if seen well, with orangey brown upper parts less heavily marked than the other buntings, no prominent face markings and largely unmarked white underparts. In flight, most individuals show a considerable amount of white in the inner half of the wing, though this can be much reduced in first winter females. They are skylark sized and structurally similar to Lapland bunting, appearing very long winged. The biggest confusion risk is with flyover birds that are backlit or lack much white in the wing. Compared to Lapland bunting, listen out for a more liquid rippling call and a clear whistled pew. Now it's time to put what you've watched into practice. That's the first one. A reed bunting. Did you recognise it? And what about this? That's right, a long-winged, lark-like, lapland bunting. <laughs> <laughs>